Welcome to the Long-Term Care Chronicles podcast. So thank you so much, uh, MPP Lindo, for coming on to the Long-Term Care Chronicles. And before we start, I'll get you just to introduce yourself and the reason why you moved forward with Bill 196. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Laura May Lindo. I am the Member of Provincial Parliament for Kitchener Centre. I'm also the anti-racism critic, critic for citizenship and immigration, and the chair of the Ontario NDP's Black Caucus. Um, I'm actually calling in uh, from my home in Kitchener, and so I, I like to start any of my talks with just a really quick land acknowledgement. Um, I think it's so important, especially when we're talking about elders and elder care. Um, so I'm actually on land that has been held down, cared for, and stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. Um, I'm on the Haldeman track. Um, the way that I had been taught to do land acknowledgements is first you acknowledge the land that you're on, um, but the most important work is making a real connection between that land acknowledgement and what that means to you and the conversation you're about to have. Um, and so, as I alluded to before, uh, what we're talking about right now are elders. And if there is one thing that I've learned from my Indigenous colleagues and friends, um, it's the importance of honoring the elders who have come before you because they have literally cared for the land and the space um, that you are able to thrive in now. Um, and so, that is actually part of what prompted me to. Um, to table Bill 196. Um, the fact that we were seeing all across the province, not just in my riding of Kitchener Center, but all across the province, um, chaos around uh, elders, wherever they were. There was chaos in long-term care, there was chaos in home care, um, there was chaos for folks that were just trying to get by on the small amount of pensions that many people receive. Uh, and we were also seeing, part of why I explained my critic portfolios, is that we were seeing a disproportionate impact on racialized people, whether they were the essential caregivers um, for elders or uh, elders themselves who, again, didn't have what they needed to be able to thrive. So uh, that is who I am and why uh, I'm doing this work. And I'm really, truly honored to spend some time with you folks today. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. And that is um, definitely all the points that you mentioned is, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have probably experienced some of those um, issues as well. So we'll start. So in, in with this bill, like who have you consulted, including with have you consulted other provinces or other, you know, um, get information from the your constituents or other constituents within the province uh, to move mm -hmm. this bill? Um, uh, absolutely. So I can tell you that we, um, sorry, I have a, an automatic thing on my computer that reminds me to smile and bring joy into the universe every day, every day, my friends. Um, so we, the, the idea of the bill started because of, um, I happen to be the member of provincial parliament in the riding where uh, the largest outbreak in long-term care, that home was in my riding. Um, it was the largest outbreak in Waterloo region and it was during the first wave. So it was at the point um, in this pandemic where nobody really knew what was happening. Um, we were trying to wrap our heads around it. It wasn't a matter of um, being able to prepare specifically for COVID. Um, we know that there was a long history, at least 15 years of advocacy that was going into trying to uh, invest in elders across the province and especially in long-term care um, but that investment wasn't there and so there are always concerns that uh, if something major does happen what is going to happen to the most vulnerable in our community I mean, they're the holders of our history and of knowledge and wisdom and all of that, right? Um, so the outbreak arose. People were trying to figure out what was going on. I had families that were calling me. Um, I had one family in particular who was, whose parent was the first person to test positive at that particular home at Forest Heights. And it was all over the news, so I feel okay about saying the name. Um, it was Forest Heights, and it's owned by Rivera, so it was a for-profit home. Um, and within like weeks she had called back and um her family member was gone and she was trying to do all of this advocacy on her own um we then started to receive um 
emails from PSWs. So I had a lot of nurses and uh, PSWs, essential caregivers that were calling, uh, talking to us about what was happening specifically at Forest Heights. And then it got broader because when the PSWs began to call, they started to explain um, their the undervalue that society has for them. They were going from home to home. They couldn't take time off. And then they were being blamed for being the ones bringing COVID. And so, um, and a lot, again, a lot of these folks were racialized frontline healthcare workers, uh, many of whom had a history of, you know, they had come from, uh, from outside of the province and outside of Canada. They had nursing degrees and couldn't get jobs in nursing and they landed in, in uh, long-term care care and elder care because that was something that was open and available to them. Uh, and so they knew about the, the, the gaps in the care system. They knew about the chances we were taking with the, with the lives of elders. So we started to draft the bill and we modeled it after um, a similar bill in BC. Of course, um, making amendments for Ontario's laws and that kind of stuff. Um, and as soon as I started to put out into the world that we were going to um, pursue tabling this bill, uh, the amount of support that I got from individuals as well as organizations was overwhelming. There were at least 15 organizations, some national, some local, uh, that sent us statements of support, explained to us how long they had been advocating, um, used it as a starting point to launch for bigger advocacy. So it was shortly after that that we started to um, hear more publicly. It's not that people weren't doing the advocacy, but we heard more publicly that Canada as a country was trying to look at uh, uh, better support and uh, an action plan for seniors, for elders, right? Um, and a lot of that was because this became an opportunity for them to be heard in a different space, right? Uh, and so a lot of people were in support. And now what's happened, we... Uh, we debated the bill in September. So the, the Queen's Park had paused because of the pandemic. Um, and we were able to move my private members bill up so that we could debate it right away because of the urgency of the issue. It passed unanimously. So every single party provided uh, full support and voted in favor. And now it's sitting in committee. And the government is the one that has to call it so that it so we have public hearings and it comes back for third reading to become law um, and they have not in the midst of all of the second wave they have not called it so now I'm getting um, calls from other advocacy organizations like other than the ones that that had reached out to me before asking what can we do now to ensure that we pull it out of committee and make this law because what we're hearing even today seems like the lessons haven't been learned and nothing has actually changed. No, thank you for that. No, that's definitely true with what is happening during the second wave. There is a lot of, a lot of, no, I wouldn't say unknowns, but they're just, why isn't the government moving forward on the, yeah should have been learned for you know for the second wave so thank you but I, I get I'll go into the next question and sure in regards to I guess with the seniors advocate will they be able to enforce and implement uh, practice to change the system as well yeah so um, that's a really good question because oftentimes we have advocates that are somewhat disempowered uh, so for instance if you have an advocate who's uh, whose responsibilities have to be met inside a ministry, technically they're reporting, their boss is the person that they're saying you're not doing enough or, you know, here's a gap in the system. And so getting the change to happen is difficult. And so one of the things, one of the most important pieces of the Seniors Advocate Act is that that office is independent of government. So it doesn't sit in a particular ministry, um, which allows it the independence to stay focused on gaps in its systemic gaps, um, things that people have been advocating for for uh, years and years, decades, in fact. Um, the other piece that's really important is that um, the advocate sort of remains connected to community. So the idea was, it's not just that we need to hear from elders who would tell us or their families that would say, oh, this, you know, we're having issues with feeding. We've seen pictures circulating on social media of these horrible, like this is what our elders are being fed 
right? A plain piece of toast cut in half, like what is that, right? Um, and sorry, I got real Jamaican right there. My parents are from Jamaica, and so there is no way that that is breakfast. Let me just tell you. <laughs> that's fine. That's that fine. Is I not understand. breakfast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, families will have a place to be able to um, explain that there's an issue. But I also wanted to have a connection between the independent advocate and the healthcare workers, because the healthcare workers, those frontline workers are the ones that are seeing that things aren't changing. Um, and it, we were hearing from so many PSWs and nurses that the for-profit homes, for instance, they just weren't doing the same thing as the not-for-profit homes. They weren't listening to the advice of public health in the same way. And even if there were inspections happening at the home, which we know um, decreased, uh, exorbitantly decreased this uh, since the new government has come in in 2018, um, even with that, you would get like a, a note saying, here's, a, here's an issue, but nothing that required you to change it. And so those, that's what systemic issues look like. And so this advocate's role would be to look at each of those systemic issues, hold the government to account, have a public report that goes out annually. Um, and the very last piece that I think is critical and a lot of people don't realize, um, we, ha we currently have a ministry of long-term care. And that was something that was brought in by the Ford government. Um, but elders care, like care for seniors, goes across all sorts of ministries. So um, my mummy, for instance, is 81, but she goes and says she's 36 and we just go with that. So my mom is 36 and um, she graduated at the age of 79 and got her first, her Bachelor of Arts, right? She had always wanted to do that. There's advocacy that has to happen in the post-secondary sector to ensure that um, seniors can, in fact, thrive in post-secondary. They may need different things. Um, so this advocate would be able to look across ministries at wherever seniors are and ensure that they are okay. Another big piece, uh, we had um, strong advocacy from the uh, retirees group, a uh, national group, um, as well as my local in Kitchener. And they pointed out to us that the amount of money like that, that elders are forced to live on from month to month is inadequate. And so that means that this advocate would be able to look at, well, how much do we give elders? What support and care do they need? Housing issues, the amount of seniors that came out and said that um, they have to live with somebody else because they can't afford rent right? They, they had to let go of their own home if they ever had one. Um, all of those kinds of things are, are issues in the system that's not supporting a very vulnerable group. And the independent advocate would have to keep the government's feet to the fire about those issues. Perfect. That's great. And with the seniors advocate, will they have the authority to enforce some of these changes uh, with, once they go through all of their investigations? Yeah, so part of the the independent advocates role, and we've had a couple, um, the current government uh, got rid of some of them. Um, so there was an independent advocate that was looking at um, the environment. There was an independent advocate for children and youth. And part of their, their role, I, I kind of veer away from the word authority because at the end of the day, government isn't supposed to be just those handful of elected officials. It's supposed to be the people. And so I, I would argue that the independent advocates authority comes from being that space that is the voice of the people. They're the voice of the frontline workers. They're the voice of the people that are in different care settings. They're the voice of, of all of us. And their job is to keep the pressure on the government and to help the government um, to come up with solutions to address the systemic issues. It's not enough to say, well, we haven't invested in 15 years. We need a plan. And where are we in that plan? Um, and so to be honest, I remember even when I was doing the debate, um, I was remarking that the advocate shouldn't be seen as against the government, but a, another tool to allow the government to do their job better, right? Um, and to connect them because 
folks in government, both the elected officials and the bureaucrats that are sort of on the inside doing the regulations and stuff, um, they're kind of, they're distanced from the issues, right? And so this provides a bridge. And I think that if we saw an independent advocate, not just as somebody who critiques the government, but also somebody who tells the public, look, we may change. Like, look, you know, let's say that they, um, add one of the bigger issues I've heard is that um, frontline workers that work with seniors are underpaid. So PSWs are so underwage for the work that they do. Um, and we know that that has been uh, seen by government because the government during the pandemic in implemented um, pandemic pay. When we were fighting on, as a member of the official opposition for an increase in the wages, um, because now we know, I think everybody has to agree that these in fact are heroes and, and such. Um, but the, a pandemic pay band-aid is not changing the system. And so the independent uh, uh, seniors advocate could advocate alongside all of Ontarians to increase PSW's pay so that they wouldn't have to go from home to home. Um, they could advocate to take um, profits out of long-term care to ensure that there's more not-for-profit homes so that people can afford them and they are provided with the care that's essential and that they need. Um, those kinds of, and then let's say that a government comes along and decides to implement those change in the independent advocates uh, report out to public, they can say, look, we've, we've addressed one of the problems right? Like things are getting better. So I think there's a celebratory nature of it as well, but it only happens if government sees this as um, support for the work that they do and a voice of the public. Thank you. And then with how would someone know to seek out the seniors advocate? Because there's many different um, roles within the government, such as like the patient ombudsman, the mm -hmm. Uh, senior, you know, the advocate, the patient advocate role. So how would they know exactly where to go and seeking out that this, I need to go to the seniors advocate? Um, so again, my sense is all of these different areas should be working in tandem. So it shouldn't be that you have to choose one or the other. And part of um, the seniors advocate's role would be to point out, for instance, if people didn't know where to go which is often a, a concern that I hear as a member of provincial parliament, right? You've got a problem, you know what the problem is, you have no concept of how to navigate the system. And sometimes my team is trying to do some of that navigating because we also don't know because it's not clearly articulated. And so part of their role would also to be to clarify that. You know, you go to this person for this or this person for that, or to make suggestions based on, um, the experts and the health experts in in their circles and across the province um, that would be able to say, well, this might work better, right? Um, the other the other piece of that as well is um, is a reality that certain communities need something different. So I think, for instance, about Indigenous communities uh, that the the understanding of where an elder would be. Like you don't send an elder to a long-term care home, you would have them in community and they're valued in community. So what are those kinds of supports and how do you um, share that information in that setting compared to downtown Toronto or in my area, in my neck of the woods in Kitchener, right? Um, I think that that's also why there would have to be a lot of um, relationship building. So I know for instance, um, if you go into a hospital, and you're seeking care for cancer. Oftentimes in those wings of a hospital or in those specialized hospitals, there's a lot of information about what you need to know. And I would want that same kind of information made available where elders are being seen and, and supported, right? Um, so I do think that there's, uh, there's a need to think about how that's communicated, but there's also an understanding that just because you went to the uh, patient ombudsperson doesn't mean that you can't come to the seniors advocate. I wouldn't want people to think that it's one or the other. It could be either or, it could be all of them. Perfect, that's great. And I know we t you talked about this before in terms of the systematic uh, issues. How, if you can just go back as to how exactly is determining, how do you determine those systemic issues that um, the seniors advocate would be responsible or try to make changes for those types of issues? 
Um, that's also a really good question. So there are systemic issues that have been pointed out um, around seniors care for decades. There's reports that have already been written. There's advocacy that's already been done. And there's even um, in the last uh, year of having to navigate COVID, um, even more reports. There have been commissions that have been uh, started by the government. All of those kinds of issues actually reflect what people have been saying for decades. So the increase of pay is one example. Um, the, the idea that we're seeing more and more data all the time that shows that the for-profit long-term care homes aren't faring near as well um, as the nonprofit, so we know that that's an issue. Um, we were hearing a lot of issues around uh, essential care workers and who's allowed in and what families need. We've heard a lot of, there's a ton of data about um, the need to have homes that are culturally responsive. Um, so, you know, making sure that, uh, I think there's one Chinese uh, long-term care home in Toronto. Uh, we need to make sure that they have whatever it is that they need and that information is translated uh, if it's public health information translated in that case but also expand right because not every Chinese person lives in Toronto so we've got to make sure that we've got access um, and that proper training for other folks outside of those areas um, also happens so that there's there's clarity about how to provide culturally responsive care um, there are issues as well that we've heard um, uh, not just in long-term care, but just the day-to-day -day navigating for elders in community, right? Who has access to home care? Are there enough PSWs available? Is, are you always getting a, a change of a PSW? Because that's something that I've heard as, as uh, one cause for concern. Um, oftentimes, it's like a pool of people, which makes sense on, on a business side, perhaps, right? Because they've they are in a system that is still broken. So they have to send whoever and people are getting worn out because they're being sent to so many different places and they don't have time for everybody. On the elder side, they're seeing somebody different all the time, right? My dad has a, um, early onset dementia. And so not having that consistency doesn't help. Uh, and so we've been able to do some advocacy to ensure that he recognizes who the person is. But as that dementia increases and the impact of that increases, the importance of having that stability is there. So those are all things that the advocate didn't even hear. And <laughs> we know that those are issues that need to be addressed today, right? Um, and so I do think that that's, they have a, a solid starting point. And then the idea is to figure out, well, what has happened? Like what changes have been in effect? What else do we have to do? And which ministries are responsible for that? They keep an eye on it. Thank you so much for that. And then with the advisory council within the seniors advocate, what would be the roles and the responsibilities and the qualifications as to who would actually make up that advisory council? Um, so I, I want to put a disclaimer on my response for that. Um, as I often say, I have my doctorate in education, so I'm a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor, right? So I, I, part of my role was to provide the framework as a member of provincial parliament. And the idea is the advocate has that knowledge and wisdom to know what those qualifications are. So in the bill, it doesn't go into the nitty gritty of that. And oftentimes that happens. Um, the regulations that proceed are the ones that would provide some of that information, right? Um, but in general terms, uh, I had envisioned, and people around me were giving feedback, we were envisioning um, that it would be doctors that work with seniors, that, you know, we're seeing many doctors that are speaking out about what's happening in long-term care homes, um, especially when the hospitals had to go in, into homes and take over some of the for-profit homes, uh, which did happen in my riding at Forest Heights, that was taken over as well. Um, and so doctors who do that work would be part of that expert uh, advisory panel. Um, we had envisioned that some uh, family members would also be there because there's a difference between the folks that know all of the medical knowledge and the ones on the ground who are seeing on day to day what the impact is of changes in policies, etc. cetera. Um, elders would be hopefully on there as well. So not all seniors, there, there was kind of a narrative, like we assumed all seniors were in long-term care homes. And so there's some 
rethinking about where elders are. Um, and the fact that we're currently in a space where over and over and over again, I kept hearing um, seniors don't want to be in long term care homes like we're, we're seeing what's happening. So nobody wants to be there. So oftentimes it's a last uh, effort to try and keep somebody safe that lands them into that space. So um, having seniors there that can talk about some of that preventative stuff and, and what is needed, but there's also a bit of an openness so that again, the advocate who's an expert is able to say, okay, here's what I'm thinking for how this advisory goes. Um, the last piece that I just want to throw in there about that is, um, from my background, my background is in education. And one of the things I used to always, I used to teach teacher candidates. So before they became teachers, I would always tell them when you're coming up with your curriculum or your lesson plans, um, don't be afraid to pay attention to how it's actually working, throw it out and start again. So my hope is that we start off with the advisory with a vision and then we fine tune it. Right. Um, and and so that is kind of how I think people have been envisioning it, but a space where there are voices from various areas that um, make sure that we have a good, solid connection to community. Well, no, that's great to know that at least it will be a broad spectrum of individuals that will be part of that council and then going through the actual appointment and the fact that there will be yearly reports and the term is set for five years is you know if someone would like to apply for let's say the senior advocate position would that be found on the um ontario website or somewhere else? yes it it would be but not until we get it into law and so currently um on the on the website you can find the actual uh bill so you can find the language of the bill um you can if you follow me on social media all of the videos of the debate and that kind of stuff are available as well so you get a sense of what people have said um and i point that out because everybody in all uh all parties supported it so you'll hear you know conservatives saying how important this is and why they're voting for it you'll hear the liberals and the the green party member um doing the same and i think that's important um it also reflects the fact that the advocate resonated across the province right from far like from northern areas down to the you know the, we were all understanding that this would be helpful so that's why i was pointing to that but while it's sitting in in committee, so it passed second reading, that's the debate that that you can watch online. Um, but while it's sitting in committee, nothing else happens. Um, and so what I do need now is that advocacy to to keep telling people and putting into the universe that this is important and that, you know, community wants to comment on it. Uh, and then the government would call it, there would be public hearings where people could talk about, um, you know, maybe there's something if you read the bill that you wish was in there. Uh, and so you can provide some of that feedback. It would go through that process. It would come back to the chamber for the third reading for the debate. Um, we would debate once more. And then if everybody votes for it again, it becomes law. And when it becomes law, then that process would begin where you would see an application available online, et cetera. But for now, it's literally, it's past second reading and now we wait. Okay, that's great. And the other thing is with these yearly reports, once this does become law, and you're gonna be getting the information that uh, you'll be tracking the data. And you mentioned before that it won't just be one particular group or section that you'll be looking at. You'll be looking at, let's say, pharma care. You'll be looking at the data as to how income relates to mm -hmm. uh, support seniors, both within long-term care and in community. And how will you draw that information from all those different um, sources to, to, you know, to produce and to show and to reflect into these reports as well? Um, that's also a really good question. I think about um, the work that was being done by the uh, child and youth advocate, the uh, by Erwin Elman. Um, oftentimes, you would see the advocate doing uh, public meetings or, you know, helping. He would do a lot of work with kids in care. And so then those kids would produce a report 
right? Um, and so there are a lot of these organizations that work with older adults that are producing reports. And part of that office's job would be to pull all of those together. Um, so again, that becomes, it's not like you're starting with nothing, that becomes part of your starting point. Um, and then based on that, we start to collect other data. Um, and we start to make sure that um, the changes that we're seeking and the expert advice on those changes is actually coming to pass. Um, and so part, I think that's the, the best way to describe how I would see that beginning process, right? No, that's perfect. That's good to know because I mean, at least to say that you'll take existing um, things that are already yeah. active now and you use that and leverage that to produce for the reports that's necessary and just another thing will you, there be a like let's say a toll-free number once this gets into play so in terms of let's say one of somebody wanted to call to report some sort of let's say elder abuse mm -hmm. they have a toll-free number that they can call to report directly to the seniors advocate as well um so that again becomes one of those depending on let's get it into law and then the nitty-gritty of it comes out i would guess that there, any other advocate or independent officer in the Legislative Assembly has a number like contact information for them. Um, how they would set that up, uh, it would probably depend on what processes people do have to complain as well, like where they want to raise issues as well. Um, so uh, not, again, not to say that they don't want to also be uh, available, but how they decide to roll out and make themselves available, I think, um, is something that I would totally want to leave up to them as experts. Okay, perfect, that's good to know. And with, um, as you know, many seniors have health-related issues and they do not have time on their side. Um, so when you're make, so when the seniors advocate would be making their yearly recommendations, would they be giving a timeline to the ministry for resolution, for resolution and for the implementation of their recommendations as well? Um, I'm a big believer that if you don't have a timeline and you don't have goals, nothing changes. Um, so my hope is that um, the independent advocate uh, would be acting in a way that puts out clear direction, timelines, and um, ideas of pathways forward. Um, otherwise, there is no plan, right? Um, I, I think that by crafting this um, based on... Uh, the BC model, that was the point, right? The goal was to say, okay, this can be done by this time. And then that's also why that advisory group is so important. Um, and not just the advisory, but the connection, the community connections that end up getting made. Um, because then your timelines are uh, realistic, right? So certain things can happen right now. And that was one of the, the interesting pieces of um, the, the first wave. Right. Uh, one of the biggest critiques that we had as the official opposition was that some stuff could just change. Right. There was no need for a commission to change and make sure that we had the investment to have four and a, uh, four and a half hours worth of hands on care for elders. Um, we've got bill after bill that passes that says that that's what we have to do. An expert saying it. Well, then why aren't we doing it? Right. Um, and so I think Sometimes the other piece is that the independent advocate, the fact that they are independent allows them to navigate the, the nonsense that sometimes happens in the chamber at Queen's Park and get to the nitty gritty, right? It's not about this party or that party. It's about what is the goal and how do we get there? And then you put a timeline on that to make it real. Thank you so much for that. No, that's great because, I mean, sometimes we hear of things and then there is... I, uh, one in the future, but it never really comes to f fruition type of thing. So um, that's good to know. And then with the bill itself, there is uh, a statement that was indicated, uh, which was called the application for certain provisions of the Ombudsman Act. How does this really apply to, uh, and what does that mean? Would you be able to clarify that? Um, so sometimes in, if I'm understanding the question correctly, sometimes in the legislation that we table, it will have an impact on another piece of legislation. And so inside the bill, it'll say, okay, so this would have to be adjusted, right? Okay. Or this would have to be adjusted. And so you just, all of that gets laid out um, yes. as well. So I think that was it. 
And uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is with the seniors advocate, will they only just look at anyone that's over the age of 65? Will they be looking at, let's say, if there's anyone that's younger that is using senior services, mm -hmm. such as, let's say, they've been diagnosed with early onset dementia, will the seniors advocate support support these individuals as well? So in my opinion, um, because the focus was on systemic change, the answer would be yes. How that support looks, like what that looks like, might be a little bit different than people expect. Um, so for instance, imagine uh, we were talking a lot about uh, some congregate care settings where we've got elders and we've got younger people as well, right? Um, and if I do advocacy to ensure that congregate care settings have access to the health care needs that they, that you know, during an emergency, access to the proper PPE or access to the people, the hands-on care people, um, then I'm actually helping everybody because I'm looking at the system. And so the, the notion of the advisory as well, um, and the notion of keeping that bridge with the public, uh, in my opinion, would provide an opportunity to show the nuances of these care settings. And so then somebody would be able to say, wait a second, it's not just older adults that are there, there's other folks are here. And maybe that would be an opportunity for the independent seniors advocate to call in another advocate to be able to help with that, right? Um, and I, so in my opinion, that's why it's so important to stress that it's not about um, advocating for individuals, which to be honest, the patient ombudsperson, that's the, the goal, right? Is like, I have an individual issue and then they can go so far as to say, here are the systemic issues that are making more patients or more advocates come and talk about this. Um, but ultimately the goal for the independent advocate is to look at the system, eye on the system. And because different people are bringing, raising these issues, they're sort of outside and they're able to put all of those pieces together. Oh, that's great. So there would be as well, you'd be getting information from other inputs and then deciding and that's great. That's great. And now I know that you've mentioned many times that um, right now the bill is in second, it's in committee actually at the moment. So what would our listeners and the public would need to do to make sure that this gets into final reading? Um, write to me. If people write to me and write to the government, and say, we want this bill to be pulled uh, out of committee. We want the public hearings. It's time for us to have a voice. It's time for us to provide our feedback on the bill. Um, we need this to be enacted. There's no time to wait. Those urgent emails, they don't have to be long. Um, they can be very short and direct, but call on the government to call it for for a committee. So it's sitting in a committee at this point, um, and literally the government have to, has to choose to bring it forward, right? And so let's put the pressure on. I often tell people um, to, uh, if they write to the government, CC me, because the government doesn't always get in touch with me to let me know they've gotten a letter about my bill. So <laughs> that's one way to make sure that I know, right? Um, and you would write to uh, Dr. Mary Lee Fullerton, who is the Minister for Long-Term Care. You can write to Minister Elliott, um, the Minister of Health, write to the Premier and tell him that you want this pulled out and write to me. Um, and with that pressure, there becomes more opportunity for us to, to bring it out of committee and turn it into law. Um, the other thing that I often tell people is um, you can write op-eds about it, like write into your local paper. Um, you can put things on social media and tag me on social media. You can make little videos. We can be creative because we're all at home now um, during this second wave. Um, and I have found that even families who have lost someone, like they've lost an elder in the midst of this, um, they're also advocating for it because they're doing it sort of in the memory of those that they've lost. Uh, so anybody who wants to start letter writing campaigns and such and get in touch with my office, hugely important. And I know that in the past, other people have also um, arranged to like make, make phone calls fill people's inboxes in all of their inboxes with messages saying this is what we want this is what we want um, and that helps to bring media attention and that helps to make sure that we get it going um, and know that we're doing this uh, in memory of so many that we lost we didn't have to lose 
Oh, that's great. Thank you. That's great information. And hopefully we'll, you know, listeners that are listening will be able to do that and uh, to really advocate to get this bill passed and into law because it really is needed for our anyone that's uh, taking part of the senior services. So thank you so much, uh, MPP Lindo, for coming on to the Long-Term Care Chronicles. I really do appreciate your time today. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.